Hello and welcome to this Elevate Education presentation for students studying AS Level Biology on the OCR board. Today we're going to be looking at three things. Firstly, we're going to be looking at why multicellular organisms require specialised cells. Then we're going to look at the five levels of cellular organisation we find within organisms. And then we're going to look at some specific examples of differentiated cells and how their structure relates to their function within the organism. All living things are made of cells, whether they be a single-celled organism such as an amoeba or a multicellular organism such as a plant or indeed a human being. When we've spoken about cells up till now, we've used these two diagrams. When we look at these diagrams, they don't actually represent two real cells, an animal cell and a plant cell that we would find in the real world. Rather, they're a generalised view that show the various organelles that can be present within each type of cell. Multicellular organisms don't just contain one type of cell, they contain many types of cells. Each type of cell is different. The way they can be different is not only in their overall shape and size, but within the content of the cells, both within terms of which organelles they actually contain and the extent to which they contain those organelles. Each type of cell found within a multicellular organism is specialised to perform a different function. When we talk about specialised cells, we often use the term differentiation. Differentiation refers to the changes that occur to make a cell suited to a particular function. So unicellular animals can only be comprised of one type of cell. That leads to the question, why do multicellular animals need to be composed of many cell types? All cells are surrounded by a cell membrane. The role of this membrane is to control the exchange of substances between the cell and its external environment. If we consider a theoretical cell, which has eight sides of one centimetre in length, we can quite easily work out the surface area of that cell. It would be eight centimetres squared. And the volume of that cell in turn would be one centimetre cubed. This would give the cell a surface area to volume ratio of eight to one. That is, for every one centimetre cubed of volume there is within the cell, there are eight centimetres squared of surface area. This means that in the case of our cell, there is a large area of membrane over which that volume of cell can exchange with its environment. If we consider a multicellular organism made of eight cells joined together, you can see the surface area increases to 32 centimetres squared, whereas the volume increases to eight centimetres cubed. This gives us a ratio of four to one for surface area to volume. So we can see here that as the organism is becoming larger, it's being made of more cells, the exchange surface, which each cubic centimetre of volume relates to, is becoming reduced. If we consider an even larger organism made of 64 cells, we can see the surface area again increases, this time to 128 centimetres squared, and the volume increases to 64 centimetres cubed. However, the surface area to volume ratio continues to decrease as more and more faces of the cell become unexposed to the environment. In fact, we get a surface area to volume ratio of two to one. So, just by increasing the number of cells in our organism, we have reduced the available surface area over which they can exchange their environment. Once we reach an organism of a certain size, there are some cells whose membranes aren't in contact with the outside world. These cells are unable to exchange substances directly with their environment. As multicellular organisms become larger, they require specialised cells that can exchange substances efficiently with their external environments, their surface area to volume ratio decreases, and also transport substances from those areas in contact with the environment to those cells that are not in direct contact with their external environment. As multicellular organisms become larger, there is also a need to develop specialised cells for structure and support, movement, coordination and reproduction. As an organism contains more and more cells, eventually, as those cells pile on top of each other, the weight of those cells can start to crush each other. As multicellular organisms become larger, they are unable to move in the same way as single-celled organisms. They cannot move just by extending areas of the membrane and pulling themselves along. They develop cells that are specialised and allow the organism to move. In the human being, these would be our muscle cells. These cells are specialised to be able to contract and therefore move the organism as a whole rather than at a cellular level. With the proliferation of cells, there is also a need to get the cells to act in a coordinated manner. For this reason, multicellular organisms develop both nervous systems and hormonal controls. As organisms become made of more and more cells, 
it becomes difficult for them to reproduce in the same way as single-celled organisms. They cannot just split by binary fission into two cells. They're too large, they're too complex for this to happen, so they need all specialised cells both to carry that genetic material and to deliver it outside of the organism. There are five levels of cellular organisation we need to know about within organisms. At the basic level is the cell, the building block of life. Cells of the same type are grouped together into a tissue, a tissue being a group of the same type of cells. In turn, different types of tissue work together to form organs. If we consider this organ, the heart, there are a number of different types of cells and tissue that go into making it up. There are neuron cells that form the nervous tissue within the heart that controls the heartbeat and carries messages around the heart. There are muscle cells, cells that have been differentiated to enable them to contract. These cells, shown in red in the picture, work together to form the muscle tissue that makes up the bulk of the heart. There are also fat cells. These fat cells store fat, making up the fatty tissue shown in yellow that we can see around the outside of the heart, and this protects our heart from damage. It is only by these different types of tissue working together that we form an organ, the heart. Different organs working together to do the same job are referred to as an organ system. For example, the heart is not useful on its own. It only works in conjunction with arteries and veins and capillaries that are able to carry that blood around the body. Together, these different organs make up our circulatory system. If we look at our excretory system, that, that contains a number of organs, including our kidney and our bladder. At the top level is what we call the organismal level. And that is organ systems work together to create an organism which in this case is a human. So the levels of organisation we've looked at are cells, tissues, organs, organ systems, and the organism. Now we're going to look at some different types of differentiated cells found within the human body, how they've become differentiated, and how their structure is suited to their function. The first two types of cells we're going to look at are both urethrocytes and neutrophils. These cells are better known as red blood cells and white blood cells. They're both formed from totipotent stem cells found within the bone marrow. Bone marrow cells can differentiate to form all types of blood cell. Because both urethrocytes and neutrophils are created from bone marrow cells, they both start out with an identical set of chromosomes, with each cell having the ability to develop into either a urethrocyte or a neutrophil. If you look at the blood smear shown on the bottom of the slide, you can see there are clear differences you can see there are clear differences between the smaller urethrocytes, red blood cells, and the larger neutrophils, the white blood cells, shown in the center of the picture. The urethrocyte is a unique cell within the human body. It's highly specialized. As it goes through development from a totipotent stem cell, it loses its nucleus, Golgi body, mitochondria, and the rough endoplastic reticulum. So these cells contain no DNA. Its shape also changes. Because the cell has lost these organelles, the membrane becomes indented on both sides. And if we look at the side view at the bottom of the slide, we can see it's shaped almost like a tree bore mint. This shape we refer to as being biconcave. The reason for this shape is what it allows the cell to do is have a very high surface area to volume ratio. This means that red blood cells present an extremely good gas exchange surface. They're able to quickly and effectively take up and lose their gases, both in the lungs and the body tissue. Besides having lost the cellular organelles, urethrocytes contain large amounts of a respiratory pigment called haemoglobin. The haemoglobin pigment allows the red blood cells to take up oxygen in much higher concentrations and much more quickly than they would be able to without it. So both the shape and the presence of haemoglobin mean that urethrocytes are ideally suited to being able to transport oxygen around the body. The second type of blood cell that can develop from bone marrow is that of the white blood cell or the neutrophil. These blood cells retain their nucleus, unlike the red blood cells. They also contain large numbers of lysosomes within the cytoplasm. This gives these cells a distinctive granular appearance. 
Lysosomes are cell organelles that contain digestive enzymes. The role of neutrophils is to both engulf and digest microorganisms within the blood. They form parts of our immune system. The reason they need to contain many lysosomes is once they have engulfed microorganisms, they need to break them down using the digestive enzymes contained within the lysosome. Quite simply put, the more lysosomes the neutrophil contains, the more enzymes it contains, and the faster it is able to break down invading microorganisms. The reason the neutrophil retains its nucleus is the nucleus contains the cell's DNA. This DNA is required to be transcribed in order to build the proteins that are the enzymes contained within the lysosomes. If there was no DNA present within the cell, the, the enzymatic proteins would not be produced. One of the specialised cell groups we see in multicellular animals are the gametes, the sex cells. These cells contain a range of specialisations. In humans, the male gamete is called the sperm cell. The first way the sperm cell is specialised is through its shape. At the bottom of the slide is a stylized representation of a sperm cell. The first thing to note is it is surrounded, like all cells, by cell membrane and contains the same organelles as any other cell. The overall shape of the sperm cell is long and thin, a streamlined shape designed to reduce drag. It also has a single long undilipodium at the rear of the cell. This is a long hair-like projection that, similar to flagella in prokaryotic cells, enables the cell to move by whipping backwards and forwards. Both of these specialised features of a sperm cell make it ideally suited to being able to swim through to fertilise the female's egg. Within the sperm cell, the cell contents are also specialised. They're specialised in that they contain a high concentration of mitochondria around the base of the undilipodium. These mitochondria are used by the sperm cell in aerobic respiration to release energy, enabling it to move. If the sperm contained less mitochondria, it would produce less ATP and in turn would not be able to swim as quickly and would be less fit. The second way in which the cell contents of the sperm are specialised is that it contains a large structure called an acrosome. This is a large membrane-bound vesicle and is a type of lysosome and it contains the enzyme that the sperm needs to break down the coating around the outside of the female egg. The last way in which sperm cells are specialised is that their nucleus does not contain a diploid set of chromosomes. It contains a haploid set. In species such as humans, there's a diploid. Each cell contains two complete copies of the genetic code. So 23 pairs of chromosomes making up 46 in total. When the male and female gametes meet, they need to form a zygote, the first cell of a new organism. This cell needs to have the same number of chromosomes as an adult cell. So in the case of humans, the zygote needs to contain 46 chromosomes. In order that the zygote contain the correct number of chromosomes, the gametes have to be haploid, in this case containing 23 chromosomes. If the gametes contained a diploid number of chromosomes, when they fused to form the zygote, the zygote will contain, it will contain 92 chromosomes. If we look at this micrograph of a sperm cell, it clearly shows the acrosome located at the head of the sperm, large areas of mitochondria around the base of the tail of the sperm, and the long projecting undilipodium that enables the sperm to move. The last kind of cell I'd like to look at is the root hair cell. These cells are found on the roots of plants. At the bottom of the slide is an image showing a magnified root. Coming off the side of the root, fine hair-like projections can be seen. These are extensions of the membrane in the root hair cells. The root hair cells themselves are located on the outside of the plant's root. These cells are specialised because they contain large outfoldings of membrane, forming hair-like projections that stick away from the plant into the soil. This is clearly shown in the top diagram. The role of this specialisation, this fine outgrowth of the cell, is to increase the surface area to volume ratio of the cell. The role undertaken by plant roots is both is both to uptake water and minerals from the soil. By increasing the surface area to volume ratio, these cells become more efficient at being able to take up both water and minerals from the soil.